you. Fondue? Food crazes come and go, and unfortunately, that means that some of our favorite foods tend to fade away. Now, we're not saying these foods have completely disappeared, but they have definitely declined in sales and popularity. So here are the top 10 once popular foods that we all stopped eating. Cherry's Jubilee. If you ask me, it's absolutely crackers. This sweet dessert staple has basically vanished. It's one of those old-timey desserts that was popular until the 1960s. Essentially, the dessert is a cherry sauce over ice cream. For the cherry sauce, cherries are flambéed with sugar and a liqueur. Usually, the liqueur is a Kirschwasser or a plain brandy. Then, this sauce is poured over the ice cream. When it was served in restaurants, it would often come to the table while on fire. Now, of course, this dish would taste best with fresh cherries, but people started using canned cherries when they began serving it in larger quantities. Any food that comes in a spectacle like this usually gets our vote, but it seems as though the magic has died out. According to some sources, the dish became a bit of an overkill once people started eating it and serving it all the time. Okay, now. Dig in using lesser quality canned cherries, making it less exquisite and more mainstream. Cherry's Jubilee actually has a royal history behind it. The dish was invented in 1897 in honor of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee by a man named Auguste Woo! Escoffier. However, his original recipe didn't include vanilla ice cream. We're assuming someone just thought this would be a great combination, tried it, and the world never looked back. Crisco. I reckon if there's anything you ought to know about cooking, is this. A staple of many kitchens, Crisco was introduced in 1911 as an alternative to lard in cooking. It was made from partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, which allowed the company to claim that it was made from vegetables in their original advertising campaigns. This ends up with a crystallized cottonseed oil, the reason for the name. In fact, Crisco was actually first used to make candles and other items typically made from lard before it was ever considered a food staple. And it became popular. People used it for everything. The most important invention since they put mayonnaise in the jar. From frying fish to baking flaky pie crusts and even spreading it on toast. By the mid-1990s, people began to care more about the foods they were putting into their bodies. They realized that trans fats were dangerous and pointed the finger at fatty foods as the culprits of heart disease. People today have started to kick the processed fats habit and turn to healthier alternatives for their baking needs. At one point, Crisco did alter its recipe to try to keep up with the demand for healthier foods. Gelatin salads. What does he want? Jello. Back in the 1960s, gelatin salads were all the rage. A gelatin salad basically consisted of a variety of food items, from vegetables to cheese and olives, and even tuna, encased and chilled in a jello mold. Part of the earlier advertising campaigns for jello promoted these salads as a great way for the housewives of America to preserve leftovers and encourage their children to eat their veggies. During the Great Depression, this was a popular idea for people to stretch their their rations as far as they could. By the 1960s, gelatin salads appeared everywhere, from family dinners to local potlucks, festivals, and public events. In fact, they were so popular that Jell-O actually released a bunch of savory flavors, such as tomato, Italian salad, and celery, to be used for these concoctions. Why does he want Jell-O? Because he's comfortable with Jell-O. The reality is that there are a few possible reasons we don't eat gelatin salads anymore, with one being the fact that they resemble alien brains being a major influence. Also, people began to try to cut down on processed foods and sugars and opt for more nutritious meals instead. But the biggest reason is probably that American housewives started leaving the home and working for a living, meaning they didn't have as much time to prepare gelatin salads and have them chill until dinner. Fondue. We're not in too much of a hurry. I thought we could stop off in Lucerne for a late night fondue. This Swiss mealtime tradition was really trendy in America in the 1970s. Fondue parties were a staple in many households and communities, especially when the first chilly winter nights hit. Sitting around a piping hot bowl of cheese with crusty bread or other items ready to dip was the perfect way to bond. And if you wanted a dessert version, chocolate fondue was right there ready to go. How 
However, while Switzerland is still sitting around their cheese bowls, dipping their crusty bread in that gooey goodness, America just isn't doing it anymore. As much, anyway. There's no real explanation as to why this fad started to die out. Perhaps too many people were double dipping. Did, did you just double dip that shit? A more realistic explanation is that in a world where fatty foods and carbs are the devil, it's no surprise this isn't a common thing anymore. Sure, you can still enjoy a great, piping hot fondue dinner these days. Some restaurateurs have actually tried to bring the trend back by putting a modern spin on it, like seafood dishes and gourmet dessert fondues. But chances are you won't be getting invited to any fondue dinner parties like you would have back in the 1970s. Sunny Delight. I got some purple stuff, some Sunny D. As soon as they say Sunny D, all the kids go, yeah! Oh, good old Sunny D. The reason we don't really drink Sunny D anymore is pretty obvious. Just check out the ingredients list for a bottle of Sunny D. Corn syrup with less than 5% real juice. Sugar, sugar, and more sugar. First you get the sugar. Then you'll get the power. Artificial colors. Contains ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, EDTA, which is currently being studied by the FDA for toxicity because it's known to cause skin rashes. There is also another side effect. In 1999, a news report revealed that a young four-year-old girl in the UK had actually turned yellow from drinking too much Sunny D. This little girl was drinking about 1.5 liters of Sunny D a day day, when her parents began to notice her skin was taking on an orange-yellow hue. This was caused by the amount of beta-carotene added to give the drink its signature color. Now, drinking 1.5 liters a day is extremely excessive, especially for a young child. But this isn't really a risk you want with your favorite drink. Earlier this year, Sunny D made headlines in a negative way that had nothing to do with the quality of their product. During the Super Bowl, the official Sunny D account tweeted the simple statement, I can't do this anymore. While it was probably in reference to the infamously boring game, many people took this as a negative commodification of depression, triggering some bad PR for the brand. Thankfully, many other brands came to the rescue to seize the opportunity and check in on the drink. You want to get some ice cream? That'd make you feel better, right? Tapioca pudding. I got a bowl of chocolate pudding in my underpants. Our argument is not that tapioca pudding has disappeared. You can still find this pudding staple kicking around at buffets and other places, but it's not as popular as it once was. Do a quick Google search for tapioca pudding and you'll find the words old fashioned and grandma's famous in the title of many of the recipes. However, to its credit, it was definitely a staple at one point. Many adults today probably remember the days when they would open up their lunch bags at school to see a snack pack of tapioca pudding sitting there. It was also one of those staple foods that many grandmas of America would make from scratch. Tapioca pudding was definitely a love it or hate it food. Some people just couldn't get past the lumpy texture. We didn't have any pudding in there, buddy. It's easy to see why people stopped making it. It's a time-consuming process. There's also another very minor risk. Tapioca is potentially dangerous if cooked wrong. Here's why. To get tapioca Tapioca, you need to grind down a cassava root. Cassava is basically a root vegetable that looks a lot like a sweet potato. However, when it's raw, the cassava root contains naturally occurring forms of cyanide. Yes, the poison. So if you don't cook it properly, you are poisoning yourself. Tapioca is heavily processed, so there's not a ton to worry about, but it does come from this root, and if it's not processed properly, it could still carry traces of cyanide. Again, not likely but you never know. Ambrosia salad. I think it's time for you to start to seriously consider salads. To be honest, ambrosia salad kind of looks like a unicorn went nuts at a birthday party and threw up. However, it tastes surprisingly delicious. This particular dish consists of fruit, coconut, and marshmallows tossed in whipped cream, or another creamy substance, and then cooled for a few hours before serving. You have not tasted any of the ambrosia salad that I made especially for you. 
The most common fruits typically used to make it are mandarin oranges and pineapple, but there are tons of versions out there. Originating sometime in the early 1900s, ambrosia salad actually became a holiday staple for Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners, served right alongside the vegetables, mashed potatoes, and turkey. It was popularized in the southern states and was reserved for the holidays because it called for luxurious ingredients that had to be imported. This made it seem exotic and fancy. However, after the 1920s, it became easier for households with a tighter budget to make because of the availability of things like marshmallow cream. It was still associated with the holidays, though. Sloppy Joes. <laughs> Once a beloved dinnertime staple for the average American household, Sloppy Joes aren't quite as popular anymore. In fact, this entry probably prompted you to remember that they existed in the first place. In their defense, many Americans still do eat Sloppy Joes. And it's easy. The dish is literally ground beef in sauce on a bun. It's also still a staple on many typical cafeteria menus. They just aren't being served as weak weekly dinners as often as they used to be. And homemade versions are often swapped for the store-bought sauce out of price and convenience. Manwich Monday should really be brought back, if you ask us. But alas, lots of people kind of just let this one slip through the cracks in favor of lower sodium, less processed options. No one really knows how Sloppy Joes even became a thing. There are plenty of theories out there, all of which involved someone named Joe. One theory tells the story of a man in Cuba named Jose, who owned a not-so-tidy bar that was frequented by Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway supposedly liked his creation so much, he brought it home and got his go-to restaurant at home to make it. My manwich! Another theory suggests a guy named Joe invented it in Iowa in the 1930s, where loose meat sandwiches are an iconic food by adding tomato sauce to the meat. Either way, lots of 90s kids' dinners wouldn't have been the same without it. TV dinners. I know what a TV dinner feels like. In the beginning, TV dinners appealed to many consumers because they were cheap and easy to throw in the oven. It all began when Swanson was trying to figure out a way they could package up their leftover Thanksgiving dinners and sell them. They settled on a frozen dinner for one, and the idea took off. People loved it. They were easy and convenient, and you could just pop them in the oven for a quick meal that could be eaten right in front of the TV. At the time they were invented, in the 1950s, the TV was a new phenomenon that captivated American households. People had never had this before and would spend a lot of their time gathered around watching the tube. TV respects me. It laughs with me not at me. To be able to eat a meal in front of it was exciting and fun. The grocery store aisles are still packed with a variety to choose from. Once the microwave became more popular, it became quicker and more convenient to reheat TV dinners. While some people still opt for convenience foods once in a while, many of us have caught on to the fact that the portion sizes in TV dinners are just not enough for the cost. Even The Simpsons don't eat TV dinners nearly as much as they used to. Not only that, but some of these meals are packed with sodium and preservatives we don't need. Plus, some of them contain a heavy dose of fat in one little tray. With more people opting for fresher foods, it's no wonder frozen meal sales haven't been what they used to be. Candy cigarettes. Check out the new toys we're making. Baby smokes a lot. When candy cigarettes first appeared on the scene, they were actually packaged to look like real cigarettes. At the time, cigarette companies were actually working with candy companies to collaborate on packaging and production. Some big tobacco companies would actually send candy manufacturers copies of their labels so they could use them. Talk about promoting a bad habit to kids. The reason this one has disappeared is pretty obvious. Anything that could make cigarettes tempting to children is a no-no. As far back as 1964, the Surgeon General was stating that candy cigarettes lured children into becoming interested in smoking. Today's research has also indicated that children may be more likely to smoke if they use candy cigarettes. Are you smoking yet? <laughs> 
For some of us, a candy cigarette represents pure nostalgia. For others, it's a dangerous entry into the world of nicotine addiction. In many countries and some U.S. states, candy cigarettes are actually flat-out banned, unless they are packaged to look nothing like real cigarettes and are called candy sticks. Help yourself to seconds and tap that screen for our next great video. Checking us out for the first time? Then take a second to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell to join our notification squad.